Welcome back. Our next speaker will be Brett Downing. He'll be speaking on the topic of GStreamer and ROS, ROS, a tale of two messaging frameworks. Brett is a hardware hacker whose passion for robotics dragged him into software development. Uh, there before we're going to see either software or robotics. Brett will allow time for questions at the end, so please enter any on the tab in Venulus. Take it away, Brett. Okay. Um, so I've been hacking on a software project to essentially bridge GStreamer and ROS. Um, pipelines are really cool. If you were at my last talk, I discussed a bit about how pipelines can help you um, build reliable software that can be extended, maintained, all the good stuff, especially as it applies to advanced robotics meeting hardware. But pipelines as a general approach to software make a lot of sense in a lot of applications. Uh, you can use them for large software projects and then all of the components, all of the functionality becomes quite small, quite maintainable. You can write new applications using proven utilities and you can teach old applications new tricks by creating new plugins for them. Pipeline elements practically operate in isolation. Elements pass messages between each other, but they aren't really aware of each other beyond that. When you build applications with a pipeline architecture, the components can become very simple and can become very reliable. If an element does more than one thing, it usually just gets broken into more elements. Elements tend to inherit a lot of code from some base package that often includes the inspection tooling and the build system. Not everyone likes that, but it certainly helps maintainers. A pipeline diagram is easy to read and understand, uh, especially understand what the pipeline as a whole is trying to do. Inspection tools that work on the single pipeline element for the base element work on all elements. The elements themselves share a lot of code conventions, making them easier to read, easier to share, easier to resurrect. GStreamer is a pipeline framework designed for broadcast media. It has very strict timing and every media converter you could think of. GStreamer's timing is so strict that it's been picked up for gravity wave, gravity wave observatories. If you want to build new multimedia applications and you want all of the codecs and drivers, and a proven pipeline architecture, use GStreamer. GStreamer has so many drivers for cameras that it's starting to show up as a core dependency for self-driving cars. ROS, on the other hand, is a pipeline framework built for robots. It shows up in consumer robotics vacuum cleaners, it moves stuff around warehouses, and it forms the core of a lot of driver assist technologies, certainly in research. Um, between the two, they have basically the same topology. Um, so there's a bit of uh, jargon that they use different names for. Um, I'll be using the, the terms pretty much interchangeably and hoping that I'm clear. Uh, ask questions if it's not clear. Uh, I'm open to heckling. So ROS started around about 2007 with the aim to end a decades-long academic abandonware cycle. Uh, every new student would throw out most of the work of the predecessor and spend all of their time fiddling with power systems and simple mechanics. ROS was developed to encourage roboticists to think, uh, to think about their robots as modular constructions, to break them down into a few fairly consistent interfaces under a shared build tool. Researchers competing on a mapping or grasping problem could at least share the code that makes the robot drive around. ROS doesn't trust the coding practices of novice roboticists, so every node is a wholly separate program. This prevents a lot of conflicts and side effects. ROS nodes inherit a lot of functionality from ROS, so they almost always build using the default build system and the default dependency manager. GStreamer was built to make it easy to build capable and extensible multimedia, multimedia systems. GStreamer wanted to aggregate new and unheard of uh, multimedia processing techniques under one stable and versatile framework that could be easily included into other applications. 
GStreamer provides a mes messaging framework and handles the scheduling problems associated with complex concurrent media streams. GStreamer aims for everything to be easily included into even simple programs, so it keeps all of its computing, the pipeline elements, under one process ID, making it one program. GStreamer elements need to inherit a lot of code from GStreamer, so almost all elements are built using the default build system. Fundamentally, robot perception and robot response data, most of the things that go through a robotics pipeline, is the same kind of information as a streaming multimedia platform. GStreamer and ROS chose the same topology as an answer to basically the same technical problem. And then for very good reasons, implemented that topology with nearly opposite design decisions. GStreamer is difficult to use for distributed computing problems because it does not provide network transports, sensibly passing that responsibility onto its elements. And there's so many of those. ROS2 is so flexible about message passing as a, as a framework that you almost never need to care which computer your node is sitting on. ROS2 gains flexibility at the cost of efficiency, so while it can do image processing, the overheads associated mean you don't want to use it for all of your streaming media. ROS2 mitigates most of those overheads that were found in ROS1, but it still can't beat the strict tempo rendering that GStreamer offers. There's a couple of ROS packages that use GStreamer internally. Uh, if you build robots that see, you're probably going to look for at least one camera driver. The chances are, if you can't find a Linux driver, you'll find driver in GStreamer. GSCam sticks a GStreamer pipeline in a ROS node, and whatever comes out of the pipeline is put into an image message, and then transported on the ROS message bus. Uh, if you build a robot that can hear or make noise, ROS is certainly not the best framework for capturing or processing real-time audio. Audio Common uses GStreamer to handle raw audio, and then uses ROS to move compressed payloads between machines. I was disappointed to discover that it discards all of the metadata and then supports exactly one MP3 bitrate, transporting only binary payloads. Uh, but this was a very early package, um, early 2010s, I think, that was only really intended for telepresence to one machine. ROS1, without the package called pluginlib, moved everything over a socket uh, through, a, through a buffer, through the kernel, and not very efficiently at that, so copying raw images took forever. The compression options were limited, and I never did work out how to tune them. Pluginlib was the first ROS package to break the one node, one process rules and allow messages to be passed between nodes by pointer, without copying or serializing data. Nodes under pluginlib share a couple of threads in a single process, just like elements in a GStreamer pipeline. ROS2 expanded pluginlib to cover all of the nodes, making it easy to stuff all of your nodes into a single process, not just the ones that inherited pluginlib. Pluginlib is still around, it just has different use cases now. The defining features of ROS2 over ROS1 was pluggable transport systems. One such transport option allows disparate processes on the same host to allocate messages, to allocate message memory inside a daemon, and then pass the message by pointer to downstream elements, and more than one of them. So you get zero copy messaging from one node to all downstream elements. There's a theme here. ROS1's messaging efficiency was painful for more than a decade. ROS2 fixed it in every way anyone could think of. Most of the time, if you want to do some image processing, you collect the image from somewhere, turn it into an OpenCV matrix, and then do your preliminary white balance and contrast adjustments in the privacy of your process before implementing your algorithm on that data. OpenCV is great, but does a node, a ROS node, need that additional complexity? Should a roboticist implement color adjustments in every algorithm they write? Would other nodes benefit from the same preliminary number crunching? 
In ROS1, that was very easy to answer. Transporting images was so nightmarishly expensive that you couldn't afford the CPU time involved to share anything but the final result. It was cheaper to just reprocess the data. In ROS2, it might be fine, but then you're just burning developer time replicating a bunch of GStream elements. So the images on screen now are... The, the, the nodes and elements on screen now are practically equivalent in every way. You could literally substitute them. So if you want to use GStreamer's ability to efficiently manipulate video streams and audio streams and multimedia in a robotics perception pipeline, why not just bridge them? So I ended up putting a ROS node inside a GStreamer element. For GStreamer, this is kind of run of the mill. It's just yet another network transport. For ROS developers though, this was a sore point that desperately needed some systematic action. And I mean, I knew it would get used, but this is the first time I've had an open source project gain traction. By putting whole GStreamer pipelines inside a ROS node, you could launch whole perception chains from a single uh, bring up command in ROS. I'll demonstrate some of that later. As every good software project begins, I started by underestimating the problem. ROS and GStreamer are both pipelines, but they're about as different as they can be while still being pipelines. ROS2 relaxed the definition of a node a little more than ROS1, so a node is really just anything that can announce that it's a ROS node. GStreamer elements, on the other hand, can't exist in isolation, so the only practical way of bridging the two was for a GStreamer element to announce that it's a ROS node. Robotics tends to have many low bandwidth streams and a very relaxed view on time. Uh, reactions should be as soon as possible, but a robust control system can deal with modest latency and a bit of timing jitter. If your video stutters though, you get mad. And on the other hand, a seven second delay on live broadcast media is traditional. Uh, special relativity says that a time without a place is meaningless. In GStreamer, the play in GStreamer, the place is one hardware device, typically a sound card, and all of the clocks and timing is propagated from there. GStreamer provides powerful synchronization algorithms to make sure audio from, say, your Bluetooth headset matches video on maybe your second monitor. They're not sharing clocks, but they're in sync. ROS timestamps, on the other hand, always come with a frame ID. So for multiple robots with multiple clocks, you can use the frame ID to talk about which robot you de derived the clock from for a time measurement. ROS can't guess how your dozen clocks are going to drift or interact, and it can't guess how you're going to prioritize your time sources, so it doesn't. I'm reasonably certain these two stances on the nature of time can't be reconciled within either GStreamer or ROS, but there's a couple of tools that we can use to you know, make it a bit easier to manage. When you set up a piece of a pipeline for broadcast media, you usually don't want to start it all at once, and you certainly don't want to touch it until you're done. If part of the stream fails, you usually want the stream to just all drop dead so that you can switch to an alternate stream. When you set up a robot, the control pipelines you use to walk to the kitchen might not be the same as the control pipelines you use to open the fridge. If part of the software dies on a robot, you want to turn on the remote control and have the robot discover the remote control so that you can drive it back to the lab instead of having to go and get the forklift. GStreamer keeps metadata with the pipeline and it has a complicated format negotiation step that goes upstream and downstream and puts together the most efficient pipeline to do a given, ch uh, a given streaming task very well. ROS packs complete metadata with each image, which gives it a bit more overhead, but it means that node developers don't need to remember complicated things like uh, video formats. They can just process each image like it was new. By promoting stateless software design, you make it very easy for novice developers to write testable code. This also means that you can play back a bag full of archive perception data into a new control system, and the new control system will behave like it was on the actual robot, 
this is great if you've just plowed 100 acres of uh, farmland, but you hit a rock along the way and tripped up the old controller, you want to see if the new controller is tripped up by the same thing. You can just snippet the, the problem part of the, the perception data, feed it into the new control system, and see how it behaves. There's no uh, setup thing at the beginning that you have to go and collect. You can just start anywhere. This difference, though, means that if a ROS node is a source of data for a GStream of a pipeline, the pipeline can't start its negotiation phase until the first ROS message arrives. So I plugged two pipelines together, and I didn't realize how uh, how much was hanging on this, how much software needed this. I've never felt like I was thrown further into the deep end. Uh, I had a lot of people doing very strange things with perception data, robotics. Uh, I started getting issues showing up on an issue tracker. Uh, I started having bugs and bug reports. Um, some of them would, you know, were the same bug over and over. So I had to set up uh, regression tests and, and build tests. Uh, ROS is a ROS has two stable editions at any given time. Both are supported by one API. But there's a rolling edition ahead of time, so you can kind of hitch your build tools to the rolling uh, the rolling release, and then get sort of advance notice for when an API changes on you. Licensing clarity. I had a company show up asking for a bit more clarity on the license I was offering it under. Uh, they wanted to use it for, as far as I can tell, uh, using robot perception data on safe. Uh, air transport, uh, drone traffic control, that sort of thing. Um, autonomous robots and certainly self-driving cars is not a thing. Um, no one currently has a fully autonomous anything, but semi-autonomous certainly, so driver, uh, driver interaction, operator interaction during a semi-autonomous procedure, everyone wants that, and GStream is a great tool to put together a means of moving perception data from one machine to another really, really efficiently. Uh, I had people doing strange things with cameras underwater. Uh, they wanted to do stereo imaging, but their, uh, their pressure envelope meant that they couldn't actually connect the two cameras as a stereo rig. They had to treat them as independent cameras and then stitch them after, which included things like time stitching. Uh, and of course, when you make something that feels like infrastructure in something that sort of bridges two worlds of self-driving cars and machine learning, all these memes, of course it's going to become homework at some point. Uh, feature creep was a thing. Uh, fortunately, people in the ROS community seem to have very realistic expectations uh, and un understanding of how much work something takes. So. Uh, I had some discussions with people about the weirdest camera formats I've ever heard of. Now, I kind of started building this because I wanted robots to interact with people like a WebRTC thing. I actually wanted to use WebRTC because uh, I've got a lot of friends who do their work in workshop environments and they move around their workshop environment. You can't just tie them to a chair and have a chat with them. You need to follow them around. Uh, this was especially for... Um, immunocompromised friends in their workshop where they got to play with their tools but if you wanted to hang out at their workshop you had to do it without bringing yourself there. Um, turns out people don't like fiddling with audio in ROS. Not sure why. Uh, GStreamer developers can treat this plugin, this collection of elements, like any other network transport. Uh, these elements aren't started by ROS, they're actually started by a pipeline. So I had to wrap, uh, I had to wrap the, I'll get to it. Uh, GStreamer has rigorous definitions for binary encodings of images and audio, which is a very good thing because the, the endianness of an audio stream almost never matches the endianness of the system that it's carried by. There's a lot of legacy code. 
uh, ROS uses OpenCV for most of its image processing, and OpenCV can deal with almost any uh, binary packaging that GStreamer can throw at it. Likewise, GStreamer can describe and handle any encoding that ROS can describe. I didn't have to touch transcoding at all in the end. The images, image formats, the, there was a one-to-one -one correspondence with at least one format on both sides. So the images, uh, the, the element and the node, they just pass on a block of data without touching it. A ROS, a ROS image topic can carry any kind of image, but it's up to the node to read the message metadata when the image actually arrives. G GStreamer configures all of its elements ahead of time, and then it needs to know the image format and dimensions of the image before going from pause to playback. So I had to add a tool to add, add, add a parameter so that you can pass the ROS node a format string to hand to GStreamer so that GStreamer can go straight from pause to playback. It's a hack, and I want to talk to a GStreamer dev about renegotiating uh, the pipeline format during runtime. Uh, so if you know how to do that, let me know. Uh, if you leave the format string empty, the ROS source will block the pipeline from going to playback until the first message arrives. Uh, G GStreamer's sense of time is very strict, very well defined. It's really good. Uh, GStreamer times, timestamps buffers through its messaging framework as nanoseconds since playback start. ROS treats time as a relative thing and then frowns on the use of datums. So the bridge nodes sample the various clocks at startup and then apply offsets so the times represent something sensible in both pipelines. Uh, I ended up wrapping the GStreamer launch syntax with a Python node that is a ROS node. Uh, a ROS node implemented in Python. A uh, little like GSCAM does, but the pipeline string can be passed in from configuration in ROS so that you can package uh, essentially a version controlled ROS package that says this robot needs these packages and needs to start these nodes with this configuration all as one version controllable configuration file, uh, configuration package. Now, I wanted to use... Hmm. I wanted to use the Raspberry Pi camera over the internet. So both ROS and GStreamer allow parameters or properties, the same thing, to be altered on the fly, allowing you to tune things as you go. Uh, robots often end, often end up on the end of a very long internet connection, a very long unstable one. And the easiest way of limiting bandwidth is to reduce the bitrate on the camera. So the easiest way of tuning the camera bitrate on the Raspberry Pi, the H.264 compression in its GPU, a uh, bit of background, the Pi cam attaches to the Pi in a low level interface. Uh, that data goes straight to the GPU, where it does hardware H.264 compression, and then passes that on to the CPU through a bit of a memory bottleneck, um, which then can be picked up by applications such as the PyCam software, which has been wrapped by a GStreamer node and is available in the public archives. So if you want to adjust the bitrate of the H.264 encoding, you need to change a GStreamer property. Now, that isolation property of, of, of pipeline frameworks means that the PyCam is not guaranteed to exist in any given pipeline. So if I wanted to capture the H.264 bitrate and expose it to ROS, I needed to capture all of the properties of all of the elements in every pipeline and expose them to ROS. The bitrate had to be captured by a general solution. Uh, Demo time. So behind me, uh, last session I had a robot claw, and I didn't point out in that session the second camera was this robot here. Uh, so on the screen now is the all of the nodes that are currently running on that robot. So I can go ahead and launch from a package some node with some configuration. And that goes and loads up a GStreamer pipeline. It goes and loads up a joystick driver, which 
then show up and stitch together a pipeline using ROS. Uh, the joystick uh, and the, uh, the teleoperation tools are exactly the same as I used to drive the claw, but this time it's targeting a wheeled robot. The mixer node handles the, the vector from the joystick and then passes that on to uh, the actual uh, the, the motor system. At the same time, I've got a GStreamer pipeline, which has a bunch of properties which can't be mapped, uh, ignoring GST objects, ignoring structures that whatever. Um, so these are these are GStreamer properties that are exposed by elements that can't be mapped in a type safe manner to a ROS property. Uh, it's picked up a joystick and it started the UDP stream. Which gives me access to the image topic, uh, sorry, access to the GStreamer compressed video feed as a ROS uh, image message. So this here is a video in ROS as a ROS uh, as a ROS message, and then if I turn the motors on, uh, not that. So this one is just a Raspberry Pi, Pi camera, a servo servo control breakout, a couple of batteries, a couple of motor controllers, and that's it. the The whole thing can be put together for. Only 50 bucks. I'm going to put that down. Uh, those ones. Um, those ones debuted at... Those robots are actually the same as the the one that I'm about to drive. Uh, these robots are, again, a Pi Zero with Pi Cam, with motor controllers. Uh, and that little mount there is for a jousting pole. Uh, these debuted at the Canberra Python user group, and we had a great time jousting with them in the park. Uh, there's two of them, and they are just identical. They're exactly the same as the little robot. It's just they're using skateboard wheels and larger batteries. Um, so if there's any questions, I'm happy to take them now. Uh, that's kind of all the demo that I needed to get through, uh, but I have a bunch of other stuff that I can show while ans answering questions. Um, particularly, I want to show the... So by using ROS, by using a pipeline framework, I can use in, uh, pipeline introspection tools to just discover everything on the network. Um, so here's a list of all the nodes on my uh, local network. So the Raspberry Pi and the laptop stuff is all discovered automatically. I don't have to worry about where my nodes sit. Um, Uh, the other one is uh, I can use GStreamer inspection tools if I tell it where I've built the GStreamer plugin I can inspect any of the elements that I've put together and GStreamer just provides automatic documentation features this is amazing for uh, software conservancy um, especially when you've got academics going through and um, you know building building up robots where you know it's their first time touching electronics touching hardware touching software the ability for people to just write some code and have it automatically get documented and then you know read their own docs to figure out what's what might be wrong what might be misconfigured this is extremely valuable to novice developers um, ROS GST Bridge is the plugin name. It's just a 
shared object. Uh, the image sync is what I'm inspecting now. Uh, all of this is inherited from uh, the GStreamer framework. And then right down at the bottom, I have just what's novel about uh, using ROS in GStreamer. So I ended up having to write not an enormous amount of code in order to make something that was really quite capable. Uh, the other one is because I've loaded ROS nodes into GStreamer elements, I can put together you know, additional snippets of pipeline um, using just GStreamer launch. So something that's really common in robotics is you have high quality cameras in a high quality lab on a high quality network and your robot never encounters mud until it's too late. So something you often want to do is either like do a bit of pre-processing or damage your video feed before passing it on to the control system. So if I run that and pray to the get demo gods, then I should have some amount of debris on my camera feed that's provided by GStreamer. So then on the node graph, I've got all the joystick stuff. Joystick stuff all the way to motor control. I've got the, the ROS node that is inside the GStreamer pipeline, producing an image message, hands it on to another ROS node inside another GStreamer pipeline, which does pre-processing. That comes out here. Uh, which then gets picked up by the RQT GUI interface. Um, now I said I covered uh, source and sync for I images, audio and text. Uh, this uh, install setup dot bash is a ROS invocation to set up some environment variables. Uh, it is a little bit tedious, and there are some people who have put together some extremely compelling bash aliases. Um, so this, so here I'm using GStreamer launch syntax to invoke ROS nodes. Uh, ROS image source puts it in some namespace. Uh, I've got some. Uh, ROS topic, and then I give the node some name. Uh, the video convert is because I'm not taking chances with a live demo. ROS text source to put a text overlay over the top. So that one might show up. Uh, I've got hide dead syncs on because there's a lot of background clutter. Now, all of those nodes, again, show up uh, their, their topics when I ask for them. There's text overlay. Let's minimize that. So image processed, image text. This is the same image on a different ROS topic. And then I can publish to it. Uh, text overlay, it's a strongly typed me message. Oop. Where am I? Data. Using the bash escaping rules.
and I've got text overlay on a video. I, I've pulled, what have I done? I've taken a ROS command line tool to produce messages onto, what was that? If I keep that going, it'll show up in RQT. So I've got the command line client submitting messages, text messages to a text overlay topic, which gets picked up by a ROS node inside a GStream or pipeline, which gets composited onto, my, wow, that's unhappy. Uh, composited into my video feed and then emitted onto another ROS topic. Um, again, this is kind of unremarkable for GStreamer, but this kind of flexibility with this many uh, image manipulation tools is just something that ROS hasn't had yet. Uh, and I've had a hell of a time, a wonderful time, talking to community members uh, about, you know, what they're trying to achieve with this bridge package, what they're trying to achieve with ROS, uh, ROS perception data. Um, and then not just, you know, what community members are trying to do with perception data, but uh, you know, what they think about uh, my code, what they think about uh, testing practices, like having a, an open source project just take off on you when you're not quite ready for it is, is an experience, but the ROS community have been really quite gracious about it. And of course, when you do that much compositing, you get a whole lot of latency and you can't control the robot. Hello. Hi, Brett. I just came in to help you with the questions. Great. Thank you. We have a couple of questions appeared. First of all, uh, which approach do you prefer? Uh, bridge the two different framework, uh, ROS and GStreamer, or two, provide a distributed framework that transparently subsumes ROS and GStreamer? I don't think you can con subsume both ROS and GStreamer. Um, both GStreamer and ROS are moving targets. ROS certainly is a bit uh, less API stable than GStreamer. Um, the, the API and ABI, the binary interface stability in ROS is something they're emphasizing within a release. Uh, API compatibility should be maintained between two releases. Uh, but there's not really much benefit in trying to subsume two enormous squiggly frameworks. Uh, you would end up creating a whole pile of conventions that a lot of people just don't agree with because the conventions of ROS are so dissimilar from the conventions of GStreamer. So what I've ended up doing is essentially merging the two on both sides. So GStreamer has a launch syntax, um, which you just saw. Uh, you can launch a bunch of stuff on the command line. You can describe your pipeline as a bunch of stuff separated by exclamation marks. So by putting pipelines in configuration strings in ROS, you can start GStreamer pipelines in ROS nodes. Uh, likewise, by placing ROS nodes inside GStreamer elements, you can start ROS pipelines in GStreamer. So I don't think that the two should be subsumed by another framework. Uh, because they they can work so nicely together. Okay. Uh, the next question is: Is there a way I can play with this stuff without having all the physical equipment? Absolutely. Uh, so there's simulation tools. Um, so in my last talk, uh, I believe it was recorded and released. Um, the claw behind me, I have a full 
I described it in ROS, uh, sorry, I described the claw in OpenSCAD, printed it, exported kinematics uh, descriptions from OpenSCAD into RViz, uh, into some kinematics tools on the command line, and then ran a simulation of the claw responding to joystick input as though it were the real thing. And in that talk, I had the physical model, um, uh, I had the physical model uh, doing exactly the same motions as the simulated model at the same time. So you don't need any real hardware at all, uh, just a laptop running usually just Ubuntu Linux. Um, and then there's Gazebo. Uh, Ignition Robotics has the Gazebo uh, simulation environment, which gives you physics, and then you can add plugins. <laughs> The, G the, the Gazebo simulation environment has plugins which support GStreamer pipelines. So you can actually... I haven't played with that yet. I'm looking forward to that. So you can put a camera into your simulation environment and then attach it to a robot and then have your control system. Just everything is in simulation. Great. So... What would you like to do now? Would you like to continue the demo? Would you like to finish? Or there are, are no more questions currently. Cool. Um, so there's the GitHub to the um, to the bridge that I've been building. Um, the other other thing I wanted to maybe look into, uh, maybe talk about, was the uh, the launch syntax. Um, with robots, you usually have hardware that moves a little bit slower than software, so you need to version control. Like people like to have uh, robots, their software and their control systems version controlled alongside um, alongside hardware revisions. Uh, so in this case, I have uh, launch descriptions. Um, this is the, the ROS launch syntax in Python. It is just a Python program. Uh, it's a little bit verbose, and there's actually some motion to putting something together that's a little nicer. But you can see in this one, on the robot at least, I've got... This is the motor driver node. Uh, and then I've got the pipeline. With the same package, I've got the mixer, which handles joystick input, and then... Uh, uh, handling the, the hardware device to synthesize the servo commands. Um, on the robot, I load the Raspberry Pi camera. Ah, uh, yeah, that was the other one. Uh, the bitrate is a GStreamer property, so... Where's that parameter table? The bitrate is a GStreamer property, which means that I can... Let's this. So on the robot I've got the Raspberry Cam UDP node. This thing handles the Raspberry Pi camera source, the H.264 parsing and payloading, uh, and these are all the properties for all of those elements, uh, which means if I can find the bitrate so this, this node is running on my laptop. The Raspberry Pi camera is attached to physical hardware on the robot. I should be able to... Uh, if I select the node... Camera node, uh, bit rate, and I've lost it again. And I get that. It'll interrogate the robot, and using the ROS pub sub um, metaphors on its bus, it'll come out with some integer value. Now, the same parameter should be able to set the 
with a number that is lower and then on the device it starts to reduce the quality of the, the feed. And if I could drag that down really low and you can see it gets real grainy very quickly. And I think I can drag that a little lower until it's you know scarcely visible. So uh, this was actually inspired by uh, a Hackaday author that developed Solarboy, which was a, a cross-country uh, rover, which was on the internet. Uh, this property mapping was intended as you know, a, an option for him to uh, manage his bandwidth more sort of automatically on the device. Um, okay, Brett, we just have a, a last question, I think, before we wrap up. Uh, what runtime are you using on the ESP32? Oh, uh, that was also my previous talk. That was the whole talk. Um, the runtime on the ESP32 is called MicroGros, uh, and then it announces itself on the, the local network as a whole ROS node. Uh, really cool, very recent. Uh, I'm really excited about that one. Go take a look at the previous talk. Excellent. Thank you. Well, thank you for the wonderful talk. And... That's it for now. We have a 10-minute break before the next session. Great. Thank you. Thank you, Brett.